Okay. And uh, well, well, we'll come back. And um, Masa was a very good or great economic theorist, as we have heard. Um, but I think his theoretical interest was often motivated by the desire to understand the economies uh, different from those in the US and Europe, uh, which uh, have traditionally been the scope of uh, textbook economics. And Masa was very much interested in the economy of Japan, where he grew up and later lived as a professor at Kyoto University um, before he came back to Stanford. Uh, and more recently, he was very much interested in the economy of China, which has been going through great transformation. And uh, I have a hunch, uh, three speakers, the three next speakers, uh, will touch upon Amasa's work uh, in relation to Japan and China. And the first speaker in the segment is Koichi Hamada. And his talk is titled Masahiko Aoki, a Social Scientist. Koichi. It is a sad occasion, but we'd really like to celebrate the eventful but very fulfilling life of Masahiko Aoki. Uh, I was supposed to talk tomorrow, so my the content is not as brilliant as to beautiful papers by Professor Aro and Milgram, but I think uh, he sent not only the specialist, but all the economists a wide message about the economy. Uh, he, Masa Hiko and I were raised in south of Tokyo, uh, Kamakura, you may notice uh, if you are familiar. And uh, we interacted in various ways, uh, but uh, not necessarily going to always into the same direction. Masa first studied Marxian economics. Uh, that was uh, the mainstay in the Department of Economics. And, but he found out quite soon that uh, some of the indoctrinated or indoctrinating Marxian economics are not a good scientific way to see the economy, and he changed at some point of time to study modern economics. And But when he was a, a Marxist, he was a leader of Zen Gakuren, the student movement. But he, he was not Probably his main role is not to join the demonstration himself, but to encourage or to write messages for the students, demonstrators. So his name, Himeoka Reiji, is very well known as the most uh, uh, articulate writer of uh, student movement. And uh, today's talk is uh, his uh, experience in Marxian economics might have had s still some influence on his life, uh, as I found out in my last conversation with him. <laughs> anyway, he 
went to Minnesota and uh, became Harvard faculty. And I was uh, at MIT from University of Tokyo uh, as a visiting scholar. And uh, at that time, he is kind of mentor to me how to conduct or how to uh, pursue my academic life there. And one critical place was Professor Dale and Linda Jorgensen's party on, I think, 1010. Charles Avenue. And uh, I was, I was from Yale, as a graduate student, I was there, but I was a sort of odd, uh, shy in the party, but uh, Linda and Masa helped me. And once Masa jokingly said, oh, Hamada san, you speak very good English. Uh, that was a great encouragement to be sort of speaking on equal terms with other specialists is one step up um, in our way of, of occupation. And he stayed mostly in the United States and I was in Tokyo, but when I had the fortune to, I should say, succeed Professor Patrick uh, at Yale, uh, Masa was uh, one of the very few friends and professors who encouraged me to pass, for me to pursue my career in the United States. And however, now it wouldn't uh, reduce my market value, but I got into some clinical depression there. And uh, I was resting at home. And uh, it was uh, Masahiko Aoki who came to see me to encourage me, he said, you must have some time to heal yourself. Uh, <coughs> and if I continue this, there are many interactions, but uh, most recent interaction was uh, at the ADB, Asian Development Bank. Asian Development Bank had a contest of economic papers of young Asian scholars. And uh, Masa was supposed to coordinate or give guide to microeconomic papers and uh, me as macroeconomic. Ma macroeconomics uh, guide or something. And uh, I didn't like personally the selection too much because uh, those bank economists and so forth always look at the methodology. Or oh, it is using DS, uh, EG, or this is using panel time series. So that's good paper. But uh, without going into the substance of uh, topics or analysis. But anyway, I had the. Uh, one very long conversations at the dinner after the conference with him. And along with another, 
dinner conversation several years ago. I learned a lot with him, and I understood a little better what he is trying to do. And uh, this time, I saw his uh, transcript at China, in China, when he visited uh, with the Bank of Japan China people. And uh, I could trust his writing because it's not propaganda or it's not just journalistic writing. So he understood macro and micro, but in the context of incentive-oriented uh, analysis. Uh, so I thought he is very vigorous and uh, he's fine, but I had a certain First, uh, going to this uh, conversation, I think he has a good background in looking at the economy as a whole and the institutions as a whole, not uh, numbers or actors economically interact, but people interact within a given institutional framework, and that the institution itself is not necessarily given from abroad, uh, from above. His, uh, I think the base of his Japanese economic analysis is that uh, we need to look at the society as a total and how the rules of conduct and so forth are given by the interactions. And I think in my field of international finance, the emergence of certain rules itself are endogenous. What kind of rules you sh should decide will affect the performances of actors after a certain rule is chosen. So it is uh, very important to think of the rule making and how incentive compatible, that is dynamically consistent rules are formed and so forth. And, but there are unfortunately strong divide between pure game theorists who look for pure logic and mathematical theorems, and like us, to think about of what kind of IMF should be made, what uh, SDR played uh, for good or uh, not sufficient reasons in those frameworks and so forth. And uh, I had uh, Fortune, when I was visiting Harvard, uh, Harvard uh, junior fellows, I met many junior fellows there, introduced by Amartya Sen, and he, they, I asked the question why international trade organization or monetary organization, how can you solve by game theory or recent uh, advanced techniques. And they said, no, no, no. Even the very simple situations, uh, like uh, anecdote or children story type of uh, situation cannot be solved by game theory properly. So why don't, why can we talk to that kind of thing? So it's a partly matter of 
the fault of game theorists. But uh, of course, probably our fault that uh, institutional collective uh, rule makings are not properly found out. And Professor Agnew, Agnew, for what all days, and Professor Aoki built up the institutional, comparative institutional analysis. And that is, I think, unique way of going into the rules uh, of game. How a certain society, differently from other part, can have well perceived or well understood rules. So common knowledge is the same, but different from other countries. And there, policies or actions of people have interactions. And uh, I, I think uh, Masahiko Aoki probably got very good uh, lesson from the spirit of Marxism that we should take uh, society as a, as a total entity. And this belief is uh, fortified by my most recent encounter with him after the Asian Development Bank uh, meeting. Masa said, uh, if we apply uh, the principle of UNO school, UNO is a very good number for Italian people, UNO. UNO Kozo, Kozo UNO is a Marxian economist who had very strong influence on Japanese intellectual and particularly economists. And he said we cannot this discuss the economy as a whole from the outset. There are basic principles that are available in any market or capitalist economy. And that should be discussed by itself. That is the first stage, pure theory. Secondary, He said, but the history revolves, so there are some stages of development in economic theory. This is the second stage, development stage theory. Today, there are not many historians from Japan, so at some conference they will explain it better more. I was just outside. And the third is to look at the actual situation that is contemporary analysis. And so, so three stages are lectured. As a non-Marxist, I felt this is uh, some camouflage that theory doesn't really apply to the real world. But uh, after, and I felt like that uh, maybe I am doing the same sort of, uh, no, I am doing modern economics, actually economics 
taught in Anglo-Saxon world, and uh, Marxists have different kind of policies, but, uh, theories, but this UNO school is the closest to modern economics, that usual economics that without politics, without institutions, that particular pure policy. So probably I, I developed some kind of hatred in close neighbors or something. Uh, Marxian economics sounded much more colorful or dramatic if we, it talks about everything dramatically, but this UNO school is a sort of antidote for me. But after his death, I thought about it. But what Massa meant was uh, in order to approach the present situation, you have to think of some different levels of analysis. Now, let's take China. China made great advances under Deng Xiaoping. That is amazing. And however, it's coming close to Arthur Lewis type of uh, transition point or turning point. So it, economic theory is a price mechanism, incentive mechanism, but the way it is conducted, particularly at this uh, turning point, is some kind of dynamic historical uh, developmental stage should be distinguished. And of course, how Chinese monetary authorities and government mix up Chinese economy is another needs another thing. So uh, Masaoki didn't explain how this three-stage theory works, but uh, he m would have probably meant that he set aside some basic current with the sudden happening in China, for example, and clarify the basic trend of Chinese economic uh, development. And uh, so I, I have lost the time to ask qualification of this. He's still Attach, uh, attachment still to the UNO theory. And when I talk about this to Asahi Shimbun, uh, it had some short column, but without my name on, probably I am uh, associated to Abenomics, and Abenomics is uh, reactionary according to some of them. So uh, I don't know why they suppressed my name, but it doesn't matter. And uh, today, Professor Jorgensen came to me. I cannot finish this uh, talk without talking about abenomics. Uh, so in three minutes I will do. Uh, I think in the th UNO, the first series that pure economic analysis sphere, abenomics, is very well conducted. And uh, many Japanese intellectuals who didn't believe monetary policy now say all sorts of things, Abenomics is end and so forth. But Abenomics created about million and one and a half million new employees. No other 
policy, no other prime minister could do it in the past 20 years. So it is uh, going on all right. Oh, uh, yes, most important thing I'm forgetting is I talked about Abenomics uh, at the dinner. And he said, I thought he is not approving this. He, in no part of his paper, monetary policy appears, I guess. Uh, he talks about the incentive problems or choice of currency. So basic theory of money and so forth, but no macroeconomic appears. So he, is rather cool, I thought, but he said kindly. Maybe he was just socially kind that uh, Hamada-san is pursuing a certain ideas for a long time, and it was at least partly realized in policy sphere, so Hamada-san should be pleased about it. So. I got uh, his endorsement somehow <laughs> in private conversations. So I was uh, very happy. Uh, and I will take any questions uh, about it. Thank you for listening. I think this is a unique opportunity for us to uh, focus on the current thinking, which obviously reflects uh, your thinking personally about this. Uh, the so-called second phase of economics. I wonder if you could uh, enlighten us about this. This is something that uh, has really come into the uh, consciousness of the public and, of course, of economists uh, only in the last six months or so. And uh, so uh, uh, what can you uh, tell us about that? I think the first column is uh, 600 uh, trillion yen as a, if that is not the objective but uh, rather aims, I uh, don't know, results of the good economics. We haven't done that at all, uh, yet. Uh, if three arrows of all the class, all, old version works completely, it would not be very difficult because 3% nominal growth is not very difficult uh, thing in the economy that would have 2% of inflation if that is uh, available. So, and the second part is uh, you should work or the way, uh, the 100 million people all working. And uh, that is good, uh, again, result if it is uh, approached. And so forth. And recently I am very happy that I could uh, publish my CD, CD of my compositions, music compositions I made in my youth, uh, less than 10 years and so forth. And uh, personally I am much more pleased than to have a publication in economic <coughs> journals. <laughs> However, politicians used, since I'm 80, it can be an event to show that I am still active at 80 years of age. I have epsilon minus, uh, two months, one month and a half before. So that uh, is going on, and the most uh, Important thing is that Abenomics or Mr. Abe 
started to look for income distribution, particularly the welfare of uh, low income, low pension people. Uh, trickle down technique didn't work for Reagan, but didn't work too rapidly or too consistently for Mr. Abe either. So that's the third pillar of the new one is uh, one good direction. Did I answer your question well or? Uh, I want to just follow up by saying you skipped one of the new three arrows. Yeah. We listed the 1.8% fertility rate. I see. That's. I don't know. Personally speaking, not to be quoted. Usually, if we can transit to less population of a smaller size, that is, can be a blessing rather than problem. The problem is we are in dynamic sequences, so less people, less workers have to support more people. But that's... Uh, But I don't, I, I am not be able to, I won't be able to defend that 1.8%. Well, I very much welcome this opportunity to speak on behalf of uh, excellent friend and also uh, my mentor, Masahiko Aoki. Uh, we have been a colleague at the Kyoto Institute for Economic Research over 10 years, but even before that and after that, we uh, collaborated in the activities of the Econometric Society and the International Economic Association and the Japanese Economic Association. So I can talk uh, too many things about him, but I will confine myself to three major points in order to uh, strike a balance between uh, what you know much better than I do and what you probably do not know so much. But uh, Koichi has uh, given us uh, some part of his early uh, commitment to Marxism. And so that part of my talk is going to be an extended footnote to what he said, but I will do that anyway. So uh, the three points I want to cover is uh, early, uh, uh, Aoki's early uh, pilgrimage. Fortunately, uh, Masahiko left us with an uh, excellent, quite readable autobiography, but uh, written in Japanese. So probably um, Hamada, uh, Hoshi, and myself are sort of oligopolist of this wonderful bi uh, biography. So I will talk some part of it uh, in my uh, early part, uh, part A. In part B, <laughs> oh, Chinese too, sorry. Um, part B is on Aoki's early impact on young Japanese scholars. Um, I'm seven years junior to him, and when I participated in the Kyoto Institute, uh, he was my uh, sort of um, uh, sh senior brother figure as well as a mentor. 
So I can testify how influential he was on the younger generations. Not anymore young, but uh, younger then. <laughs> and uh, here, um, I will talk about his first book in economics, uh, written again in Japanese. The book is called The Economic Theory of Organization and Planning. Much more on this book later. And thirdly, um, although I am a, a resident of a strong age in many respects, but I want to do something more modern. So I will uh, talk something about our key concept of institutions, if time allows it. So let me begin with Aoki's early pilgrimage. Um, here, I will just cite from his uh, autobiography. My subject of specific, uh, special study in economics and my professional point of departure uh, was to liberate myself from the influence of Marxism, which I studied during my undergraduate days and to proceed to the mathematical analysis of economic systems. Before long, I became less than satisfied with this subject of research and began an attempt to cultivate a new research area to be called the comparative institutional analysis. This is a discipline to study how institutional forms uh, which subsume not only economic and political institutions, but also social norms and cultures can be diverse and to pursue the universal principle that underlies such a diversity. This is a beautiful summary of what he uh, did lifelong, but I want to do something more by focusing firstly on Aoki's early commitment to Marxism. Um, as uh, Professor Hamada mentioned already, uh, Aoki's early commitment to Marxism was quite conspicuous, but it was not just a scholarly learning of the Marxian social philosophy and economics. He was actively involved in the Zengakuren activities, which was at the heart of the 1959 1960 campaign against the Japan-US Security Treaty that raged all over Japan. I was then the second year high school boy and uh, rather distant from Tokyo. So I was just uh, looking at the newspapers and how these brilliant young students are leading a political campaign against this uh, attempted uh, uh, continuation of the Japan-US Security Treaty. Um, Aoki played a leadership role in student activities that were not under the control by the Japanese, Japan Communist Party. This is rather important point. Aoki was one of the uh, founding member of Bund uh, when the new treaty was about to be signed, Zengakuren activists, including Bund members, tried to prevent Prime Minister Kishi from flying to Washington. Those who, were occupied, those who occupied Haneda Airport were arrested and Aoki was among 77 students who were uh, detained for legal trespass and property damage. Now, according to Aoki himself, uh, the 1960 campaign was epoch-making in that it sent a clear, very clear signal that the nature of social game to be played in Japan was altered beyond retriever. On the one hand, it revealed that there is no future for a political a system seeking for magic band by supplementing the insufficient democratic governability of the ruling party. 
uh, by means of outright regulations or by means of political force and even military power. On the other hand, it also that re uh, revealed that the long-standing leftist myth of the vanguard uh, who organizes and controls spontaneous political act actions by ordinary citizens under its guidance is bankrupt beyond rectification. The upshot of this view is that Bund played a catalytic role as a switchman between two regimes, the militaristic and regulatory regime, and the liberal democratic regime. This is a very optimistic view, uh, which summarized what he felt after the end of this uh, uh, early political activities. Now, Aoki's involvement in political activities forced him to spend two additional years before going to the Graduate School of Economics, University of Tokyo. The first year he spent on UNO economics, as uh, Professor Hamada mentioned. But in the second year, Aoki studied by himself Samuelson's foundations, the Blue's theory of value, and Arrow's social choice and individual values. So when he eventually entered Graduate School of Economics, he encountered an article that changed his life altogether. I'm not dramatizing. This is a you know, story which was told in his autobiography. The paper is Arrow Habits, Computation and Decentralization in This Social Location. What they established in this paper is isomorphism between optimization program and competitive price mechanism. Uh, if the economic environment is classical, <coughs> without externalities, without increasing returns, there will be the one-to-one -one relationship between optimization program and the competitive market mechanism. And this is uh, what uh, seemed to be uh, re to be revealing to Masahiko Aoki, because um, in the 1930s uh, there was a controversy uh, on the rational possibility of economic planning, and uh, the conclusion was a little bit ambiguous, but after thought. Uh, the message was, was quite clear, and this isomorphism established by Arrow and Hurwitz uh, was a sort of epilogue to the economic planning controversy in the 1930s. Now, Aoki to correct uh, on this uh, phase of his life, I was completely fed up with uh, illogical partisan and political disputes Aaron Hurwitz posed fundamental questions of economic organization and applied transparent logical methods for their precise analysis. This is exactly what I have been searching after. Now, this revelation eventually led him uh, to graduate studies in the University of Minnesota where uh, he completed his uh, uh, PhD thesis under, su under the supervision of Leo Harvitz and John Chipman. Uh, he was appointed subsequently uh, as um, assistant professor of the, uh, Stanford University, where he joined uh, his mentor, Professor Kenneth Arrow, and he also met Konai Janosch, with whom he nourished his lifelong friendship. Not only Aoki, but also Konai devoted themselves to the Marxian uh, heritage while 
young. Now, in Aoki's own words, in Japanese, by the way, in the 20th century, Marx's dynamic social philosophy might have been something like a measle for those who would eventually think academically about economics of uh, economic institutions. Now, this is the uh, first episode I wanted to uh, add as a footnote to Professor Hamada. I now proceed to the second one, namely Aoki's early influence on economic analysis in Japan. In 1971, Aoki published his first book on economics uh, in Japanese. Uh, it is called The Economic Theory of Organization and Planning. Now, this book was, um, to be honest, quite uh, revolutionary to us young students. We have a rather long tradition of excellent mathematical economists who did uh, wonderful work on general equilibrium theory and so on, but never have we learned about uh, alternative view of looking at the institutions as a variables, choice variables. The institutions are given like a competitive market mechanism and we are uh, you know, indoctrinated how wonderfully it works if the classical environmental conditions are there. But, uh, viewing economic institutions as variables a new revelation to us. And this book by Aoki was the first book on uh, economic mechanism design uh, in that sense. It was quite uh, uh, you know, revealing to most of us. And uh, also uh, those young scholars who studied their work and uh, Aoki's influence did not pursue the same uh, route he followed subsequently, but uh, we always remember how revealing uh, this book was to us. Now, let me refer back to Leo Harvitz. Um, Leo Harvitz gave an excellent Richard E. D. lecture in 1973, and it was called the design of resource allocation mechanisms. Traditionally, according to Harvitz, economic analysis treats the economic system as one of the givens. The term design is meant to stress that the structure of the economic system is to be regarded as an unknown, an unknown in what problem? Typically, that of finding a system that would be superior to the existing one. The idea of searching for a better system is at least as ancient as Plato's Republic, but it is only recently that tools have become available for a systemic, systematic analytical approach to such, such procedures. This new approach refuses to accept the institutional status quo of a particular time and place as the only legitimate object of interest and just recognizes constraints that disqualify naive utopias. Now let me summarize the three major features of Aoki's influential book. The first point is obvious. It is the first book in Japanese on the mechanism design, which introduced this uh, uh, very fresh viewpoint. Secondly, it was quite uh, comprehensive in coverage. And not only did it cover his own <coughs> Uh, you know, important works on mechanism of design beyond the classical economic environments, but it also covered the many classical 
uh, contributions in a very comprehensive and coherent way. That is why we are charmed. So it covered Harvey's classic, locus classical, <coughs> namely optimality and informational efficiency of resource allocation processes, two-level planning by Kornai and Riktak, and Maran Bowles, decent, decentralized procedures for planning. Thirdly and lastly, the expositional ingenuity that mixes passion and reason. <coughs> it has a tone, very charming tone. And I have a senior friend who said, okay, well, I cannot uh, read Aoki's book because the uh, sentence used there uh, connotes some sort of agitation by leftists. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, for us uh, young scholars, that uh, you know, very sort of charming rhythm was part of the charm of his book altogether. So anyway, so this is uh, where he started. And I may now turn to the third issue because time is pressing. And this third part is on the concept of institutions as families of game forms. Uh, it was Aoki himself who neatly summarized his own view on institutions with reference to such classic views as institutions as rules view due to Douglas North versus institutions as equilibrium view, which usually is attributed to Andrew Schotter. Now, Aoki wrote on North's view that institutions are the rules of the social games is not much far from a tautology and went on to assert that the original meaning of institutions is deeply rooted in the notion of equilibrium. This is what he said in his very recent paper and uh, he attempted to synthesize the institutions as rules view, a la North, and the institutions as equilibrium view, a la Schotter, by invoking Hayek's concept of cognition by classification in the decomposition of possible events in a strategic space. His grand plan is yet to be completed but will be completed in the near future, I hope, at least. Now, I want, to, I want to refer to the alternative view of institutions. Uh, this is a view uh, quite clearly attributable to Leo Harvitz. The families of game forms institutions as families of game forms, not just a single game forms, but the families of game forms. Um, Habits introduced this concept uh, by means of many classical articles, books on institutions, but in order to uh, summarize it in my own way and revealing my own identity, I will put it uh, in the context of social choice. There are three issues in the game form theory of rights. So theory of rights in social choice theory probably originates in amateur sense, uh, just three famous impossibility of a parity and liberal. But um, originally I worked with it uh, accepting Amartya's way of articulating rights. But I soon became a little bit uh, uh, uneasy about the way how it was articulated. So we introduced an alternative approach called uh, individual rights in terms of game form. So this is known game form approach to individual rights. To 
illustrated, there are two passengers, Anne and Fred, in the same compartment. Anne cannot stand cigarette smoke. Fred is a cigarette lover. An authorized notice is on the board. Please refrain from smoking if the fellow passenger objects. There are three feasible alternatives, X, Y, Z, where X is an object and Fred does not smoke. Y is Anne does not object and Fred smokes. And Z is Anne does not object and Fred does not smoke. Now, when we proposed this game home approach to individual rights, Amartya was on his way to somewhere in Asia. So he spent uh, quite a long time on the airplane. So when he came back, uh, he wrote uh, 24 pages uh, in response to our uh, alternative view on rights. And one of the point is that if we accept that, we have a problem, different problem. Namely, if we allow individuals freedom, complete freedom of choosing their private uh, options. So we have a situation like this. If we decentralize and let people uh, be free to choose, then Am may object. It is her, uh, within her uh, options. And Fred smokes. So it is a clear violation of the notice in the compartment. So institutional design cannot be articulated in terms of game form. That was his point, and certainly we had an answer. Define the following normal game form G. Namely, a set of players uh, consists of Ang and Fred. A set of admissible strategies for each player is that Ang has an option to object, and another option not to object, and Fred has one option to smoke if not objected, not to smoke if objected. And the second option for Fred is not to smoke no matter what. We now decentralize and no problem at the equilibrium. We can respect the individual's freedom of choice and then there is no contradiction. So that is how game form approach comes in. Um, however, both Sen and ourselves are using rights as if it were a manna from the heaven. Rights are assigned from somewhere above. And the rights is an important part of institutions, which is to be socially chosen. So that is where the families of game homes comes in. And so we have a two-stage procedure in which, in the first stage, we choose which game form to implement. This is a social choice problem. And in the second stage, we play that the chosen game form to realize what individuals are endowed with. So I decompose the problem into three parts, namely the initial confirmation of game home rights, realization of the conferred game home rights, and on top of that, what is the contents of rights? Now these three stages uh, we can articulate in terms of the uh, families of game forms and social choice out of it. I don't have time to go further, but um, hmm. by the way, this game form rights was not a, just an alternative. It's a criticism against uh, a social choice theoretic articulation of rights. I skip that, and I just uh, want to end with a concluding remark. John Clare wrote in a letter that had life a second edition, oh, how I would correct it. <coughs> now, being a bit of perfectionist, 
uh, OK might have wanted to proofread and revise some minor details of his life. It seems to me, however, that there is no need for revising anything essential of his life and work in view of his brilliant accomplishment in intellectual activities and his strong ties with friends and colleagues all over the world and his influence on many fellow economists and young scholars. Well, Masahiko's legacy will serve as an integral guidepost for many years to come. And I just wish to add, may he so rest in peace. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The last speaker of this segment is Shinji Chan, and he will talk about Masahiko Aoki and China. So in the uh, previous two presentations that uh, uh, people talked about Masaoki and his contributions, especially uh, in the context of uh, in, in, in Japan. Now, my pre presentation will be uh, focusing on his interactions with Chinese economists, as well as his studies and influence in China. The first time I met with Masa was exactly 25 years ago in this building, and Sina Hall. At the time, the economics department was located on the third and fourth floor. And in early 1990, I was on a job market and visiting Stanford. And later in the summer, I joined the economics department. And since then, Masa has been my mentor and my role model. Um, so it's very uh, special case for me to make this, uh, this uh, presentation, this very location, when they see so many of my former colleagues from the economics department uh, at Stanford. Before I talked about Masa's influence in China, I would like to first to mention a few things about Masa's personal intellectual inspiration for me, for my research. Masa and I shared some academic, common academic background. Both of us uh, were trained as a macroeconomist. His uh, academic advisor at Minnesota was uh, Leo Hurwich, the previous speaker uh, talked a lot about. And my, one of my other academic advisors was um, Eric Moskin. And the Hurwich and Moskin would later, uh, in 2007, together with uh, Roger Myerson, received the Nobel Prize in economics for their contributions in mechanism design. I think that has a lot uh, in common between uh, Masa's training and interest and my training and interest that we think about similar problems uh, in terms of microeconomics, in terms of information economics and mechanism design, and try to use this theory to analyze uh, and understand institutional features and the economic performance, in his case, uh, of Japan, in my case, uh, of China. In the fall of 1990, the fall quarter of 1990, a group of uh, people at Stanford and uh, several 
people here present, uh, including Masao Aoki, Abner Greif, uh, Paul Milgram, uh, John Litwack, and myself, we started a, a new uh, research area uh, at Stanford. It's called uh, Comparative Institutional Analysis. It's called also known as CIA. And the three words were very, very, very carefully chosen. It has to be comparative, it's about institution, and it has to be analytical. So that's uh, be because the study of institutions have a long, long history. Uh, if you think about the, uh, 100 years earlier at Stanford, Van Blom, he studied institutions, uh, but a bit more descriptive but had a lot of insights. So in the 1990s, because of the development of uh, game theory, development of uh, the work of uh, mechanism design, et cetera, uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, instruments and tools to have uh, better an uh, anal uh, analysis of a variety of institutional forms. In the 1990s was also time that institutional analysis were more accepted and respected by a mainstream economists. In particular, do you remember that when Ronald Coase got the Nobel Prize in 1991, and two years later, Douglas North received the Nobel Prize in 1993. Uh, those were the signs in the profession that very careful analysis of institutions are really uh, received uh, mainstream uh, recognition. During those times also, Oliver Williamson also very often came to, from Berkeley to Stanford to the CIA seminar. He would later also uh, receive the Nobel Prize. So that's one of the line of research that inspired uh, this seminar. Another line is more applied. John Litwack at the time worked on the Soviet Union, later Russia, and myself worked on China, and Masaoki worked on Japan, Efna Greif working on the uh, history, economic history. So all these combined together had generated a great interest in research on comparative institutional analysis at Stanford. There are some specific influence on myself, on the in intellectual uh, research. That's Masa's contribution to, uh, uh, to the study of the Japanese economy and the Japanese firms, in particular, his work on the horizontal versus vertical in information structure in what he called A firm uh, and versus J firm, A firm uh, motivated by American firm and J firm motivated by the a Japanese firm, and his study on the bank monitoring versus market audit on monitoring, and his, the, the stakeholders' views about the firm. I think the background of this is that before his analysis of the Japanese economy and Japanese firms, um, people used to uh, attribute culture as uh, very shorthand explanations for the different uh, institutional forms and performance in Japan. I think his contribution is that we can use standard microeconomic theory, rational behavior, game theory, et cetera, to explain observed uh, difference uh, in the institutional uh, forms as well as economic performance, such as just in time, such as Kanban, such as lean production, et cetera. So that actually motivated my research on China. Again, we leave aside of culture. Of course, culture has a lot to do with that, but let's first leave that aside and using standard game theory, information economics, and microeconomic theory, try to explain that observed uh, difference uh, and uh, a very uh, unique form of institutions try to understand the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the performance of the, in my case, the Chinese economy. For example, um, my study on the township village enterprises together with Jia Hua, he is chair, he is here, um, compared with state-owned enterprises on the one hand and private enterprises on the other, 
is really echoes earlier study by Massa on the JA firm and J firm. By the way, I think the contribution of this study of Massa is to show that under different conditions, such as the worker's capability, uh, et cetera, will decide the comparative advantage of different institutional and organization forms. It's not the absolute advantage, it's a relative. Similarly, uh, in our study of TVEs, of state-owned enterprises, and private enterprises, private enterprises, we derive the conditions that uh, give to the, uh, to the relative advantage of each organizational form. Also, my study of M form and U form with Jacques Holland, he's also here today, and Chen Gang Xu also, uh, uh, also has the feature that influenced by uh, both Oliver Williamson and Masaoki. Again, my study on unitary versus the federalism with Roland and with Barry Wangas, the political science department here, also has that flavor. Now I want to move to uh, Massa's connection with China. Massa's first visit to China was actually in March 1976, before the Cultural Revolution ended. He visited Da Zhai at the time was the most famous model village for agricultural production during the Cultural Revolution. Here's one picture of Massa in March of 1976 when he visited this model village. According to his autobiography, for the last almost 20 years, he didn't go to China. So the next time he went to China was 20, almost 18 years later. Instead of visiting a village, he visited township village enterprises. In the 1990s, Master supervised several Chinese PhD students at Stanford some of them now back to China play very important roles. Uh, I named three of them. One is Jia Hua Che, he is now here. He is going to make a presentation this afternoon. He is now the department chair at Fudan University in Shanghai. Bo Li is now a very important person in making decisions on monetary policy in China. He is the department director for the monetary policy department at the Central Bank of China. Lian Zhou, he's the department chair at Peking University. Uh, he's also playing a very important role. So, since the summer of 1994, Massa visited China every year and formed lasting friendships with many of the Chinese economists. This was the visit after 18 years of since 1976, that in the summer of 1994, um, we visited the township village enterprise in Guangdong. This is a picture that Jia Hua was the, uh, the left, second of the left there, and Paul Milgram in the middle, and Masaoki also next to him. That was uh, 20 years ago. But that was a very, very important trip because this, uh, since this trip, that many things happened. So after this trip. Right after this trip, uh, we attended a conference held in Beijing Hotel, in a hotel by the name Jinglun. So it was named as Jinglun Conference. Uh, four Stanford economists, in addition to myself, so Masaoki, Paul Mirgum, joined by Larry Lau and Ron McKinnon at the time. Uh, we attended a conference and on the reform of the Chinese economy and enterprises. Several, the four participants at the conference later played a very important role in the next two decades for Martha's activities in China. Mr. Wu Jinglian, a very prominent economist, he will later visit Stanford two years later, spend a year here uh, at Stanford in this building, actually, at APOC, uh, in, this, in this building. And Mr. Chen, minister, he was the vice minister of uh, economic commission. He was the organizer of the conference. And later, uh, he served as the chairman of the board of a particular institution I'm going to talk about uh, later. Two other young economists at the time. One is called by the name Mr. Zhou, Zhou Xiaochuan. 
He was the vice president of Bank of China, not China's central bank, but a commercial bank at the time. He was a vice president, and now he's the governor of the People's Bank of China. He just achieved his major milestone last, last week, that for Chinese currency RMB to be part of a SDR. That is one of his major legacy will be. So, but that in those days, 20 years ago, he was a very junior vice president of the Bank of China. Another person uh, was Mr. Lo, Lo Ji Wei. At the time, he was a director of a system reform commission. Now, he's the minister of finance. Again, that person very closely related to, to Stanford. So all these four people participated in this conference. By the way, in retrospect, that conference played a very major role uh, in China's economic reform. By the way, in 1994, the per capita GDP of China was around 300 US dollars. So that was uh, 20 years ago. That was the background of it. There was a picture, the three people. The person on the left was the Mr. Zhou. That was now was the governor of the central bank. In the middle was Masama Aoki. And uh, on the left was, uh, the right was Mr. Zhou. On the left was Paul Milgram. Uh, at the time, 1994, at the conference. Now, I want to mention three specific intellectual contributions by Masa Aoki on China. First is, a, is a, the corporate governance, the idea of corporate governance. In the 1994 conference, Masa made two presentations. One of them uh, was about corporate governance. And uh, someone suggested we should have the book translated into Chinese. So this book was edited by Masa and myself and published a year later by the title Corporate Governance in Transitional Economies. It's about the agency problem and insider control, but in the context of the state-owned enterprise reform in China. Because the topic usually refer to the situation in a market economy with diffuse ownership, so then the managers have de facto control. In China, the context is different. In the state-owned enterprises, because the assets owned by the public, but uh, de facto there's no owner, so therefore there was very ineffective monitoring of managers by the state, so this creates an agency problem and insider control problem. So in this context, very quickly, the concept of corporate governance, that was actually the first time translated into Chinese and introduced to the Chinese uh, the, uh, economist, economist and as well as government officials for the first time. So Masaoki was very much associated with the term corporate governance because of this book and because of his presentation in 1994. The second intellectual influence about the role of the state, there's another book that translated into Chinese, The Role of Government in East Asian Economic Development, Comparative Institutional Anal Analysis. This was the first time comparative institutional anal analysis were appeared in the Chinese press. Now, there was this conventional view of the market failure approach. However, in a country like China, um, the market uh, was very uh, less developed. So if you talk about market failure, it seems to be market failure was everywhere. Uh, it's not like in the US, a very mature economy. So this alternative view, the market enhancing role of the state were, was really resonated very well in China, such as to security of the property rights, building institutions to facilitate market, that resonated very well in China. So in this particular context, that the role of the state um, uh, you know, should play in the transitional economies, rather than just look uh, to study that standard textbook about uh, the monopoly uh, situation that government should have very good regulation. So that's, uh, that's a different, all, uh, all, that's a different uh, perspective. The third is the very term and approach of comparative uh, institutional analysis, his book published by MIT Press toward a comparative institutional analysis was translated into actually, the translation was done in parallel uh, when he wrote this book by his student, Lian Zhou from Stanford. 
So the Chinese edition was published the same year as the English edition. So this book has made uh, comparative institutional analysis very popular term in, uh, in China, probably more popular in China than in the US because of the given this particular context of the Chinese economic reform. Interestingly, that institutional analysis much more popular in China and uh, consider more Im very important uh, uh, subject of economics than general equilibrium theory for good reasons because this, uh, you know, the transition from pl central planning to market is mainly about the institutional change, the price mechanisms and uh, actually the general equilibrium theory actually uh, uh, is, uh, is uh, considered a, uh, uh, a following up of the institution's buildings. So for, I, I want to emphasize this particular context uh, in China, so that made Masaoki's work uh, very, very influential. So that's the one decade between 1995 and 2005 that Mata made big impact uh, in terms of intele his int intellectual contributions. Now, the next decade from 2005 to 2015 uh, is another uh, area that Mata made major contributions. That what he called entrepreneurship of knowledge. This is his word. In 2004, Mata discussed with some Chinese economists about the possibility of a major donation from Toyota on education, research, and environment in China. They discussed many possibilities, and finally they decided on two major ventures. One is to establish a financial aid program to support poor students to attend college in central and western China. At the beginning, they want to support poor students, and Master decided only to support those students who are going to the central and western China, not east coast. China, that's his idea, he ins insisted on that. Second, to establish a research center at Tsinghua University. This was an important informal meeting uh, in the summer of 2004. The people I mentioned actually earlier appeared here. Uh, from the left, the third from the left, Mr. Chen. At the time, uh, he retired from his position as vice minister and then he served as the dean at the time at the public policy school uh, at Tsinghua. Later, the research center was located in that school. And then the fourth from the left was Mr. Wu, the pr very prominent uh, uh, economist in China who visited Stanford uh, in the 1990s, and he would later serve as the co-director of the academic committee together with Masaoki. And the, uh, the next to him uh, was Masa, and the next to, uh, to Masa's right was Mr. Lo, the Minister of Finance right now uh, in, in China. So the first, the Toyota Financial Aid Program, they select the 20, at the beginning of the 20 universities were selected uh, in Central, and later the few added, so there are 20 plus universities in Central and Western China, and each university, 10 poor students from poor family background were selected and will provide with 20,000 Chinese yuan or equivalent 3,200 US dollars for full four-year college tuition. The college tuition in China each year, 5,000 yuan. So four years, 20,000. So up to now, already 11 cohorts of students are supported since 2005 a total of 2,590 students. This was a very, very uh, success successful program. The institutional legacy was CEDAC. Actually, one of the uh, directors of the CEDAC is also present here. Ms. Uh, Chen Ling was, uh, is here. CEDAC stands for Center for Industrial Development and Environmental Governance at Tsinghua University. It was established September 27th. 2005. This is the first of its kind, and uh, this was really ahead of time. Consider the environmental problem today. That was the first institution to not just study environment, but in terms in the view of institutions and governance. That was the first 
of this uh, institution. The board of directors chairman was Mr. Chen, as I mentioned, and academic committee, the co-chairs, Masaoki and, uh, and Mr. Wu. The first decade, uh, from 2005 to 2015, the first decade was the intellectual collaborations among the Chinese, Japanese, American economists. I want to particularly mention that uh, this was a time uh, was amid the, the, the diplomatic tension between China and Japan. But during these very difficult times that Masa was able to bring Japanese, Chinese, American economists together to study, to do research on industrial development and environmental governance. And the 10th anniversary celebration uh, was organized on October 25th of, of this year, the last uh, a month ago, a little bit more than a month ago. Very unfortunately, Masa uh, could not be there, but there was a special session held in memory of, of, uh, of Masa. Uh, Takeo Hoshi was there and made a presentation Reiko, Kyoko, Aoki were both attended this, uh, this session. The video was shown, and there are many, many uh, very memorable moving moments during this session. Finally, I want to mention that Masa's Aoki's last three trips to China in March and April this year. Uh, the first trip is very intense. The first trip was March 21st and 22nd, China Development Forum. Masa uh, uh, actually uh, attended this forum in the last 10 years. Every year he attended this uh, nationwide forum. April 4th, I remember this day very well because it was the day of Easter at the same time as a Chinese traditional holiday also. So April 4th, the 16th Academic Committee meeting of CDAC uh, Masa attended every academic committee meeting since its inception 10 years ago. And then April 21st to 24th, Masa made a presentation at CDAC conference. He also met with Mr. Wang Qishan, who was the number six on the Chinese uh, hierarchy, in the Chinese hierarchy. He is the person, he is the, the secretary general for the party disciplinary commission. Uh, uh, Anti-Corruption Commission. Uh, he met together with Frank Fukuyama. Uh, that was a very, very uh, important meeting, and uh, the meeting transcript actually leaked out to the internet, had a lot of uh, impact in China. And also, finally, he met with the Tsinghua students. Right after this trip, uh, back to uh, Stanford, he was admitted to Stanford Hospital right after returning from China. I want to, in a final moment, I want to show you a few pictures from that, those three trips. Uh, this was the trip uh, to the China Development Forum in March. He made a presentation and speech there. This was the second trip in April 4th, uh, the 16th Academic Com uh, Committee uh, of, the, of CDAC. And that's the last trip. Uh, he made a presentation about Kuznets process. Uh, I think Jiahua Che this afternoon will elaborate more on this. And then, after he met with uh, Mr. Wang Qishan, he talked to the students. He uh, wrote the Tsinghua students that innovation for students of Tsinghua Masahiko Aoki, uh, April 24th of 2015. And this was the picture that he was so happy with the students. I think that was a very, very last moment. He was at Tsinghua. I think he feel very, very, felt very, very happy. And uh, we may hope that uh, he, will have he will have peace. Thank you very much. Rest in peace. Thank you very much. Not getting away so easily there, Ying Yi. Uh, sorry, Paul Cheard. I was at Stanford in 1991, also uh, with you at the time. Um, I mean, your fascinating presentation and, and those 
photos are priceless, including some of the earlier ones. Um, as you were talking about the, the different way of thinking about the role of the government versus the market in China, and market enhancing rather than just being obsessed with market failure, I came into my mind the third plenum decision of November 2013, where the big message that came out of that was, from now on, the, the market playing a decisive role in the economy with the government sort of stepping back a little bit. Sort of any comments on that, the significance of that and how that fits in? And if I can just throw one more question in. You didn't talk at all about what uh, Massa thought about how ultimately the market and the state institutions would interact in terms of their development with political institutions. And we talked earlier about rights governance, etc. But did Massa ever share with you any of his thinking about ultimately where the political system and political government governance might go uh, in China? The first question, that's only a half of the sentence. The complete sentence is, the market should play a decisive role in resource, um, resource allocation, and the government should play a better role. That's a complete sentence. People usually forget the second half. So now they use the t word very carefully that it should play a better role. Now the better role here interpretation, my interpretation would be you know, more marketing enhancing or more, you know, it's a combination of many, many things. So that's, uh, that's the answer to your question. The second question, that's a hard question. Actually, Martha um, did not talk to me directly about the uh, political institutions. He is more, you know, um, he does not have a particular dogmatic view on this. So uh, he didn't, so in contrast to uh, say another common friend of us, also another my advisor, uh, one of my advisors was uh, Janusz Kornai because he came from very different background. He came from Hungary, so, so has a very strong view about the political evolution, et cetera. But Massa came from a different background. By the way, both of them had Marxist uh, background training, but because they came from different economies, one from Japan, that's a very mature democracy, the other was a very different, the former communist institution, so they have, uh, uh, they clearly have a different uh, approaches to this about the political institutions and transition. And I think there, there will be a hint to the second question you asked on the political institution or evolution of political institution in uh, Massa's paper, which will be delivered by uh, Chao Hua this afternoon. So we break for lunch now, and the lunch will be served in the room back there. So you can go there, and it's a buffet-style take lunch, uh, come back here and take lunch, or go 